So we uh, last time we had successfully proved that six is even. Um, so I want to point out a few more things about this. Um, we're going to update this a little bit. So I'll make another proof that six is even. Um, one thing I want to point out is that uh, so if we think about um, actually no, let me just. So I say SSE something something. So if I go in this hole and I ask, so I do control C, control comma. Did I put that on here somewhere? I did, yeah. So control C, control comma like shows you information about that hole. Right? It says, okay, your goal is you have to give a natural number. And by the way, there's a constraint that says this hole has to be equal to four. So it actually already knows that the hole has to be four. Um, so, uh, and how did it figure that out? Well, it's not that hard to see. We're trying to prove that six is even. And we're doing that by using the SSE constructor. And so if this is gonna be a proof that six is even, then what does n have to be? I mean, suck suck of n is six, so n has to be four. Like it can, it can just compare those and see that n has to be four for this to work. So in fact, uh, I can just put uh, an underscore. Uh, so in a pattern, underscore means the same as it means in Haskell. It means I don't care about this thing. right? This is not a pattern, though. This is in a term. In a term, it means you figure it out. It means there's, there should be enough information for Agda to figure out what term has to go there, and it should just figure it out and put it in there. I don't want to write it. Okay. So that's kind of nice. So I can do that actually for all of these. And that works just as well. So underscore means you figure it out. <clears throat> now, so that's often useful. But in this particular case, there's actually something even better we could do. Um, it's a little silly to even have to put the underscores because Agda's always going to be able to figure them out. And um, so we can do something else. So I'm going to call this uh, even, uh, I don't know. This is uh, even i. Call it the i. So i stands for implicit. So here I have this, this n argument. I'm going to change the parentheses to curly braces. And that makes this argument implicit, which means you do not have to actually provide it as an argument when you call the function. So it is an argument, but Agda has to figure it out. You never actually write it. So uh, Haskell actually has these kind of. Uh, specifically, when you call a polymorphic function, the actual type you're using is like an implicit argument, right? Because it really is kind of an extra argument to the function. You first choose what type you want to use, and then you give the arguments. But Haskell always just figures out what the type is. So this is the same kind of thing, but generalized to anything, right? So anytime you have some argument and you're like, yeah, just based on the types of things, you should be able to figure out what this is. I have to give it, but um, I don't want to have to actually say it every time I use this function. So, so this means n is an implicit argument. So we could redo the same thing, even 6, you know, i, even i 6. So now, oops, uh, oh, I have to say even i. All these ones have to be even i instead of even. Okay, I think I hadn't saved anyway. Um, so now if I say S S E I So I didn't give it that n argument, and it's just expecting a proof that 4 is even now. And 
I mean, again, in fact, Agda is plenty smart enough to just figure out what this is going to be. So if I hit Control C, Control A, it just fills in the rest of the proof. And now I don't have, like, those numbers, those n arguments are still there. Implicitly, Agda is figuring them out and sticking them in there, but we don't have to actually write them. Okay. So that's nice. Um, questions at this point? Let's say if you wanted to prove like even, let's say 50. Yeah, that 50 is even? Yeah. Sure. In that sense, is it also going to like, like complete like 20 terms like of SSD? Yeah. Let's try it. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Only 25. Okay. Like. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, it's a little unwieldy. If you wanted to prove that like, a thousand is even. Probably what I would do is start proving some other theorems that are like, oh, if you know, like if you double the number, you multiply by two, that's still even, or you know, or that's always even. Or you could prove some theorems that would let you give a much shorter proof that you wouldn't have to explicitly, you know, list all of these things. But um, all right, let's get rid of that. Other questions? Is there like a function like fix y combinator that we could use to take off mm. those like... It's a very good question. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute, actually. Mm. Ivy? So, if Agda has all these cool features, uh, why would you say it isn't used more... Why would you say it hasn't replaced Pascal? Um, because it's not... Uh, it's not super practical. Like, there's there don't exist a ton of libraries for it that do real world stuff you'd want to do. Um, it also, like it's interpreted, like there is a way you can compile it like to Haskell, but I think no one's worked on that in a while, maybe. I don't remember the status of it. Mostly people write Agda code just to type check it. People rarely run their Agda programs. So it's used as a, you know, to prove things about programs or to prove theorems, to play around with type theory. Um, so, uh, there is another language called Idris, which I actually, the last time I taught this course, I used Idris instead of Agda, um, which is also dependently typed like Agda. It's very similar to Haskell, but it is explicitly engineered to be a practical programming language. Um, and uh, so, you know, also, I mean, Haskell just has like, decades on these other languages and there's just a lot of libraries and momentum that you build up. Um, so, yep. Any other questions? All right, um, let's prove that uh, three is even. So, um, I have to give a proof that 3 is even. So, by the way, uh, well, no, I'll show you that later. So, I guess if I have any hope of proving that 3 is even, then I'm going to have to use, uh, well, let's use even i. So, I don't have to write all those. I guess I have to use the fact that it's a success, uh, successor of successor, because it's not 0, so... I have to use SSEI. Oh, okay. I hadn't actually, I changed it to even I, but I didn't reload after that, and so it still had the old definition. Okay, that's why it was, all right. So, uh, and now I have to give a proof that one is even. All right, this is probably not going to work. And so in fact, you know, if I try to say auto, it says I didn't find a solution, right? And if you look at this, right, well, I can prove that zero is even. I can prove that the successor of the successor of something is even, and one is neither of those, right? So neither of these can possibly apply. So I'm not going to be able to do this. Yeah. I have a question. Yep. So you 
sensors are auto complete. I know that the control C, control A is yep. full filling. Is that the same? Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I did that. I did, let's do control C, control A, okay. and it just says no solution found, right? Um, okay. Now, however, let's think about something. So let's take a step back. I have to give something here in the hole of type even I3. Do I have anything of type even I3 laying around that I might be able to use? So what? Even 3. Even 3 has type even I3. So you can actually, uh, so control C, control comma will give you information. Control C, control period is kind of the same, but it shows you like here's what your goal is. And the thing that you currently have typed in here, in there, here's what its type is. So you can use it to like compare and be like, is this the right thing? Okay, so if I do that, you can see that it tells me, yeah, your goal is this, and you have something of that type, so this should work, right? Uh, so I do control C, control space. It fills in the hole, um, but it gives me some kind of error. And if I try to load it, it turns this ugly kind of salmon color. Okay, and it says termination checking failed. So here's the thing. Uh, this is why, I, I, we talked, I think I talked about this before. Um, this is why the Y Combinator ruined lambda calculus as a foundation for mathematics. Because as soon as you can do arbitrary recursion, you can prove anything you want. Right, so here, you know, I can make up any proposition I want, and if I just make it immediately recursive, it's like it has the right type, and it just sits there spinning forever and never actually constructing something of that type, right? Um, and you could make something, you know, much more convoluted that doesn't obviously uh, just look like this, but that still doesn't ever terminate, and you could make, you could use that to prove something bogus. So Agda, now of course, as we also know, right, we talked about you know, type systems, they carve out some uh, conservative subset of the possible programs. So Agda only accepts programs that it can prove will always terminate for every input. There are some programs that do terminate that it can't prove it and so it won't accept it. Right? But any program that doesn't, that is, does have an infinite loop, it will definitely reject. Right? And that's because if you allowed arbitrary recursion, then you could prove anything you want, and then the whole thing would be completely unsound. We want, we, we would like the guarantee that anything that Agda accepts corresponds to a valid proof. So, I mean, it kind of accepts it in the sense that we could keep writing other code and checking it, but it's, it's going to yell at us loudly um, that it cannot prove that this will terminate. Okay. Um, so. An interesting implication of this actually is that Agda is not Turing complete. So there exist programs that you cannot write in Agda because it won't accept them because they're not obviously terminating. Um, but it turns out that being Turing complete is kind of overrated. Um, you can do a lot in Agda and it's uh, I don't think I know of any useful programs that someone wanted to write that the conclusion was, well, it's just not possible to write that in Agda. I do know of some programs that are easy to write in other languages that you have to do really convoluted things to convince Agda that it does, in fact, terminate. But, um, for example, writing merge sort is kind of tricky. Um, but uh, you can do it. And so, so not accepted. Agda can't prove that it will always terminate. I mean, in this case, that's kind of an understatement. Obviously, this will never terminate for any, I mean, you know, but, but that's the right way to state it, right? It'll only accept things that it can prove will terminate. And we'll talk a little bit later about how, you know, wh what kind of analysis does it do? Because we'll see that it's not just like, oh, you can't do recursion. That's not what it says. You can do certain kinds of recursion as long as it can tell that it's like getting smaller and it's going to hit a base case and it'll always stop. Yeah, Ivy. Does it detect mutual recursion or like 
one thing is falling yep. another, but that thing is... Yeah, it can handle that too. Okay. Yep. Yeah, as long as it can tell that, that the something is getting smaller, um, basically. That's the very basic version, but... Okay. Yeah. Like in the normal mathematical, when you say we want to prove something, mm -hmm. we give a, like, a logical argument that says that thing right. is correct. Yes. And if that thing is not provable, we use like a, a contradiction proof that right. says it's not going to hold. Yeah. In this sense, if we're using Agda to prove like even four or even six, yeah. we can provide the solutions that is going to show that it's possible. Yes. Like so when you say even of an odd number, yeah. Is this like the the contradiction part that like we're going to end up in an infinite recursion? Is that the contradiction part? No. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's an excellent segue. That's exactly what I wanted to do next. Mm -hmm. Let's prove that three is not even, okay. which we can do. Um, this is not a proof that three is not even. This is just like, well, I didn't manage to do it this way, okay. right? Um, now, some things, of course, aren't necessarily decidable. You might there might be some proposition, and you can't prove either that it's true or that it's false. But in this case, we definitely can prove that three is not even. So let's see how to do that, okay? So the first thing we need, uh, we need to encode not. And we actually saw how to do this on a previous homework, right? If we have some kind of bottom type, right, then, or some kind of bottom thing, right, then not p is the same as p implies bottom or p implies false, okay? So that was a, we had a proposition called bottom, right? And remember, it did not have an introduction rule there's no way to say, you know, if, if this, then bottom, because we didn't want to have any way to construct it. So the type that that corresponds to is a type called bottom with no constructors, which we never really had a reason to do that in Haskell, although you actually can. But um, I have to say it's a set. Okay, that's the complete definition of bottom. Say data bottom is a set where, and then I don't put anything after it because there's no constructors. I should not have any way to construct. Any constructor I gave would be saying this counts as a proof of bottom, but I don't want there to be any proofs of bottom. Right. Okay, and then I'm going to say, or I'm going let's go define not. So I'm going to define uh, not. And remember, the underscore shows that this is like a prefix thing. It's got one argument which comes after it. And uh, this has the type set arrow set. That is, it takes a type or a proposition and turns it into a new one. And it's defined as not p is defined as p implies bottom. And here you're also seeing, of course, you know, the way that we're mixing up the term and type levels. Because normally we would think of this, like this arrow thing, That's a, we would think of that as a type. But here I'm writing it as the result of a function. But in Agda, functions can return, can take types as arguments or return types as output. No problem, because there's actually not really any distinction between types and terms. Yeah? There's that term that says P implies bottom, is yep. that like a lambda expression? No, nope. it's not a lambda expression. No, it's, mean? I mean, it's the same as like, the, it's the same as this. It's a, it's a function arrow. I'm saying the, the type, which is the result of not P, is the type, the type of functions from P to bottom. So that's the function declaration or function definition? I'm defining, it's a, this, I'm defining the function not not as a function that takes a type as input and gives me a different type as output. Okay. I know, we've like, we've spent half the semester building these carefully constructed like hierarchy of categories of like terms and types and now I'm telling you, yeah, now everything's just all in one big bucket. Uh, but, be that as it may. <coughs> so, let's prove that uh, I want to prove that three is odd, right? So I want to prove not even three. I might need parentheses there. I don't. I don't think I really do, but might as well. So how can I prove this? 
Uh, well, this says, okay, you need to prove not even three. Um, but we know that not even three really means even three implies bottom, or even three, a function from even three to bottom. So actually, really that means I'm being given a proof that three is even, and somehow I have to produce a proof of bottom. Uh, if I load this again, right, I added an extra argument here because I really know this is a function type. And now if I ask for the info in that hole, it says, yeah, E3 is a proof that 3 is even, and uh, your goal is to prove bottom. This still seems like it's going to be difficult because I don't have any way to make a proof of bottom, right? But let's see what we can do. Um, what could this proof look like? Let's pattern match it on it in C. So if I say, all right, E3, control C, control C. Oh, you know what? I, need, I, just, I keep forgetting to use this even I thing so we don't have that pesky. OK. So it says, all right. Notice, normally, so what just happened, actually? It's worth, it's worth rewinding this and thinking about this for a second. Uh, right, even I, that type has two constructors. Normally when we think about pattern matching on something, we have to put like one case for every possible constructor. Right, why did it only put one case? It's because, right, we know that E3 has type even I3, and Agda looked at these constructors and it said, well, it couldn't be this one. This one makes an even I0. It couldn't possibly be, if you have a proof of even I3, it couldn't possibly be ZEI. So it didn't bother making a case for that. Um, but it could be this one, so it did make a case for that. And now, I still have to prove bottom, and now E3 is a proof that uh, 1 is even. Right. What could this one look like? Could it be a ZEI? No, because that's a, that proves that 0 is even, this is not 0. Could it be an SSEI? No, because SEI applies suck twice. Yeah. If to go like random, go end up on negative one. That's right. Yeah, exactly. SSEI proves that some number that's a successor of a successor is even, and one is not a successor of a successor. It's just successor of zero. So actually, when we go to do a, if we case, if we do a pattern match on E3, it's going to you know, make us one case for every constructor that could possibly match. And it turns out none of them do. So what's going to happen? What happens is this. This is, like, this is called the absurd pattern. This, this thing means there's nothing that could possibly go here. So therefore, you don't have to put anything after the equals. Right, because it's saying, yeah, you're 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 saying you have an argument of this type that couldn't actually exist, so you don't have to say what the output is going to be because you couldn't possibly ever get this input. Right, this is a function that no one can ever call. Right, it's like yeah, if you had a proof that three is even, then you could get a proof of bottom. Because no one can ever make a proof that three is even. So this is, in fact, a valid proof that 3 is not even. Yeah? What would happen if you call this function? I can't. What would I give it? It's a compile it and then try to call it something. Call it with what? I don't know. I have to give it an argument of the right type. The right type is I have to give it a proof that 3 is even. Where am I going to get one of those? I mean, that's right. That, that's the point. That's why I'm able to prove this. Um, because you cannot, in fact, make a proof of 3 is even. Kate? What's stopping you from doing that with, like, 6 or something like that? Like, 
why can't you just but because like obviously six is even yeah but like if you just don't want to take any arguments doesn't that just look like so oh so you mean like yeah. if I say if I try to say okay let's do SSEI you know just do that mm -hmm. okay yeah, that's a good question so let's see what's going to happen yeah, it says, hey, you, you claimed that there's nothing that's going to fit here, but actually there is something that could fit here, there, which is SSEI. And so it doesn't let you do that unless... It actually will. It actually, right. Agda will only accept this pattern when, in fact, it, it can prove that none of the constructors could possibly fit there. Yeah. No, good question. Questions? Yeah. If you come back in a normal sentence and you say, prove that six is an odd number, mm -hmm. if somebody asks you that question, how would you prove it? We know that six is an even number. So right. say, when somebody said, prove that six is an odd number, right. how could you go about it? Do you like, like, is that an impossible question? Are they holding a gun to my head or, or not? No, no I'm right. just, because I'm thinking, oh, what just happened there? Right. Are they saying, no, 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 no. You, you can ask that question because there right. is an answer that says six is an even number. Yeah. Now, if someone said you have to prove that six is an even number or six is an odd number, I would say, sure, no problem. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> let me let me think about it. Come back tomorrow, and I'll pr I'll I'll prove it to you. And then when they come back tomorrow, I'll put I'll keep putting them off as long as I can. Uh, that's the only way to. So if they accept infinite recursion, then I can then I can prove it, right? Eventually. Event <laughs> no, not eventually. Just. Uh, yeah. And that's exactly why Agda does not accept infinite recursion. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to show you, um, I'm going to show you about proving equality. So if we go back here, we had this, uh, we had this is even function on booleans, and we've also made this type. Uh, even or even I that we it seems to us constitutes you know evidence or proof that a number is even um, and uh, we might like to show that these things actually are the same in some sense right that is even the is even function will return true for exactly the same numbers that we can prove are even right um, and you whichever you do you can think of it as if you already believe one of them, you could think of it as proving the other one is correct. Or it's just like, well, let's just at least know that these are about the same thing. Um, so let's see how to prove that. So but in order to prove that, uh, I want to say something like, all right, so how to prove is even and even i are about the same concept. I want to prove something like, you know, if is even n, then, uh, no, but I can't just say is even n. I have to say if is even n equals true, something like that, right? Because is even n by itself returns a Boolean. Uh, But it doesn't make sense to say, like, the Boolean is not itself a type that I could give evidence for. It's just a true or false value. But I can say, is it equal to true? Um, but in order to say this, uh, we have to s see how to encode and prove things about equality. So um, turns out equality is not even built into Agda. You can just define it. Um, <coughs> And uh, usually we write it with triple equals because, of course, obviously the, the double equals is taken to like define things. So this is uh, backslash. You can just write it with backslash equals equals. Um, and uh, let's see. Don't worry too much about the man behind the curtain, but uh, I'll, I'll 
I'll say what this means in one second. Uh, Um, basically this means, well, okay, if you're talking about two things being equal, there has to be, they have to have some type. They have to have the same type. And so what type you're talking about things being equal at is like the first argument. But we want it to be implicit because we don't have to every, we don't have to, we don't want to have to write the type every time that we use equals. It's like, oh, equals on the natural numbers of three and five or equals on whatever, right? It can just figure that out from whatever the types are of the things that we say are equal. This is the part that, don't pay too much attention to this, um, like why is this thing over here on the left of the colon and then we have an A over here. But basically it means we have two arguments, they're both of type A, and we're just going to give the name X to the first one. Um, and then the whole thing is going to be uh, a set or a, think of it as a, a prop the proposition that these two things are equal. Right, so this is not a function that returns a boolean. This is a proposition that I could prove or not. Right, you see the difference? Uh, we're used to thinking of them as kind of being the same, but a function that returns a boolean says, you give me two things and I will check and tell you true or false, are they equal, yes or no. The proposition three equals five, right, maybe I can prove it or maybe not. It doesn't, it doesn't like evaluate at all, it's just, it is a proposition and then I could give a proof of it perhaps. Um, there may be things where, you know, there's some type where you can't necessarily write a function to test whether things are equal, but you might be able to prove that certain things are equal. Yeah, David? So there's only two arguments here, so if you want to add an extra one, so if you want to add like a B, could it be a comma inside the curly braces or finding the type of it, or would you add another whole? Oh, if I wanted like, like that or something? Yeah, and you want a B to be not a set. Oh, yeah. uh, no, I could just do it like this. I could do, you know. And you can actually, you can put arrows here or not. I don't, yeah. It could be like, you know, B is in that, and yeah. Yeah, in fact, let me, let me put a little arrow here because it's optional, but maybe it's nice to put it because, uh, actually, I'm not sure. No, I don't think that makes sense, actually. Anyway, so how do we construct evidence for the fact that, you know, some x equals some y. Well, it turns out what we want to do is say there's only one way to construct an evidence that something equals something else, which is if they're literally the same, then I'll, we'll call it REFL for reflexivity. So REFL is evidence that x equals x. Now the thing is, this doesn't actually mean that you, you can only prove things where the two sides literally look exactly the same. Because Agda is willing to like reduce things to do computation, basically to do beta reduction. Right? So it's using it this is like basically alpha beta eta equality is built into Agda. Right? So uh, as long as the two things on either side are alpha beta eta equal, like you can reduce them and they reduce they compute to, to the same thing, then it'll be like, yeah, cool, those are the same. Yeah. So why do you have uh X uh, equivalent to X instead of like X equivalent to A? Because uh, I don't know that I can prove that X is equivalent to A. X and A might be totally different. I'm right. saying that the, the case in which I'm willing to accept evidence that something is equal to something is if those two things are actually the same, then I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a good proof that they're the same. But wouldn't one thing always be the same as the same thing yes. as it is? Yes, exactly. That's what equality means. David? How does it differentiate between the two x's? It doesn't. It doesn't need to. I mean, well, one is on the left of the equals and one is on the right. It doesn't need to distinguish between these x's here. If when I write equals, like I can write down a proposition where something is equal to something co totally different. I'm only going to be able to prove it if ultimately I can convince Agda that the things on the two sides are actually the same. Maybe that's the way to think about it. I think if we do start doing some examples, it'll start to become a little more clear. This honestly, like, this definition s seems very magic, and it honestly still seems kind of magic to me um, in some ways. So let's not worry too much about the definition. The point is, 
If we're trying to prove that two things are equal, if they are literally the same, then we can prove it by saying REFL. And then we'll see how actually that's enough to build up all of what we want to talk about equality. Okay. Um, so let's prove, quickly, let's prove like a couple properties of equality. So one thing we might want to know is that equality is uh, transitive. So, so I've got some type A, and I've got X, Y, and Z are all of type A. Okay, transitivity says, oh, let me put something. Uh, if I have a proof that x equals y, and I have a proof that y equals z, then I should be able to prove that x equals z. Seems reasonable, right? This should not be called equality if it's not transitive. Okay, well let's think about how to prove this. So, uh, Incidentally, I don't think I've mentioned this before. Uh, White space, is, so Agda accepts like arbitrary names with arbitrary characters mixed into them for things. So unlike Haskell, where if you write like three plus two with no space in between it, it knows that you mean the operator plus applied to three and two because plus is a different category of thing than three and two. In Agda, if you write three plus two with no space, it's like, cool, you have something named three plus two. Okay, which is really nice in some ways, but it also means like, if I took the spaces away from these, it wouldn't parse anymore. It would think it was just a name. So you have to put space around all your operators. But it does mean, for example, I can, you know, I'm taking this argument, which is a proof that x equals y, and I can literally name it x equals y, which is kind of cute, I guess. And it just helps me remember, remember what that is. So if I load this and I ask, it says, all right, yep, you've got y equals z is a proof that y equals z x equals y is a proof of this, and then you have to prove x equals z. Um, and then I've got, you know, x, y, z, a, whatever. It says not in scope because, like, I haven't actually, they're implicit arguments, so I can't directly refer to them. Um, there's a way that I could if I needed to, but. Any ideas what I should do? Was that? Yeah, so if I try to do REFL right now, that's a, that's a great idea because I'm trying to prove that some, these two things are equal, and so that's like the only way I can prove that things are equal. So it says, yeah, I don't know, like, that would only work if, if, I, if Agda knew that X and Z are the same, and it doesn't know that. It says, I don't know that X and Z are the same. Okay. So not, we're not quite there yet. What else could we do? Yeah. Do you have a asking for type? Anything. So mm -hmm. maybe if you ask for a type of X and no. a type of Z, and then you can uh, they are the same type. Okay. No, they are the same type. They're type A. Oh. Yeah. yeah, Ivy. Could you ask it uh, autocomplete? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's that's <laughs> fair. Let's do it. Control C, Control A. No solution found. <laughs> Eric, could you use some pattern matching on like Y equals Z? The only way that you could that is from reflexivity, which says that that implies that Z is Y. Right. Yeah, let's try it. So if I, oh, well, let's do, you know, we can pattern match on either one. So, so let's, so Eric suggests pattern matching on Y equals Z. So if I say, okay, let's pattern match on Y equals Z. <coughs> so it was willing to do that. It said, hey, the only way you could have constructed this <coughs> was that this was actually REFL. The thing is, right. Now that we know that this was REFL, that means that Y and Z actually must be the same. And so if we now look at what our goal is, what we have to prove, we now have to prove that X equals Y. Why is that? Because it learned that Y and Z were the same and it replaced Z with Y here. So this is the really interesting thing. In a dependently typed language, pattern matching on things can actually, you can actually like find out stuff about later types um, because the values of the previous terms can affect the types of the later terms, right? So 
pattern matching on things actually, you actually learn something from that that may like reduce or change what it is you're trying to prove later. Um, so, okay, now I can just prove this by saying, I could just use this, I have a proof of the x, x, x equals y, I could just put that there. Or I could also pattern match on x equals y and learn that in fact they're the same too. And then I would just have to prove that x equals x and I could use REFL. So any, any one of those would work. If we had also pattern matched on this one first, then we could have just used this proof there. I mean, either way. So let's just pattern match on both, just for fun. Right, now it's like, yeah, now you have to prove that x equals x. And we're like, yeah, now we can use auto. So it says REFL. So it's, it kind of seems like cheating. It's like we didn't really do anything. We're just like, yeah, those have to be the same, those have to be the same. So every, everything's the same. We're good. Yeah. So here, if at the beginning, we made this distinction between like a, a, a function that takes two things and tells you a true or false, other two things are equal, and a proposition that proves that this thing is this thing. Right. In this case, yep. we are writing a proof. Yes. So, so how can you test your proof? Like, how can you test it? How can I, I test it? Of calling trans of like three, 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 and then get the true value? Like I mean, I tested it by asking Agda to type check it, and Agda said, Agda said it's good. So if we believe that Agda is consistent, that Agda doesn't have bugs that would make it accept an invalid proof, which certainly it could. Uh, and in fact, people sometimes find them. But usually they, they figure out very convoluted ways to use some weird features that interact in a strange way that you can prove false. But uh, And then it gets fixed. But uh, I can't really directly test, I can't like run this. This isn't something I can run, right? This is a, I'm writing this down as like a lemma that I'm going to use to prove other things. But I mean, I could, I can run it. Well, I can run it, but what does it do when you run it? It takes two things that are ruffle and it gives you ruffle. Like what it does when you run it is completely uninteresting. The, all the interesting stuff is happening in the types. Ivy? What makes it so that in Acta, if it checks, it works, but in Haskell, if it checks, you have no proof that it right. works? Well, a few things. So number one, usually, so Agda's type system is, uh, Haskell's type system is not as rich as Agda's type system. So there's less logical properties that we can encode in Haskell's type system. Or we have to use more convoluted methods to encode them. Um, so that's one thing. And, and we, we actually rarely, like when you write down, you know, a merge sort or something, right? You just, the type of it says, oh, you give me a list and I give you a list. That type doesn't tell you anything about whether your sorting is correct. Right? It just says it's going to give you a list if you give it a list. And if, if Haskell accepts it, then we're, sh we're really sure that that's true, right? That if you give it a list, it's going to give you a list back. Um, but you, to, say, to show that your sorting function is correct, you'd want a much more complicated type that says, I'm going to give you a list back, and also that list is a permutation of the input list, and also it's sorted in the sense that if you, you, know, you compare things, it's going to and you can encode all that as a type in Agda. And then if you can write down a function that has that type, you, you, you have a correct sorting algorithm. Um, the other reason is just that Haskell has recursion, right? So you could always just have infinite recursion, and it would accept it, and it would type check. And so you're never quite sure, did this type check because I actually proved it, or because I, I accidentally made an infinite loop somewhere? So that's another reason. Someone else have their hand up over here? David? What do you mean? Just like a bad definition of REFL that just doesn't work. A bad definition of REFL? Like if I change this definition up here? No, you purposely make it not work. So, uh, uh, um, I don't, I'm not sure how to do that off the top of my head. Well, I mean, yeah, no, I'm not sure how to do that. How come we never use the A uh, for the REFL? What do you mean? So we only use, like, the X. Right. So we're only using, like, one term. 
Well, this is an Im implicit argument, mm -hmm. so I don't have to explain. It, it is an argument. Like, this equals is being applied. It looks like it's only being applied to x, to two things, x and x. Mm -hmm. It really is being applied to a type A first, mm -hmm. but it's implicit, so Agda fills that in for us every time. So are there two different x's? There's a left x and there's a right x. They just look like x. No, there's w in, in the definition of REFL, there's one X, and I'm just saying that REFL has the type, for that one X, it has the type X equals X. Now, of course, I can use equals on things that are not, don't literally look like the same thing. Um. So, like, how would that work? So, like, how would... It, so, for instance, you would want to prove that 2 is not equivalent to 3, mm -hmm. and so it would try to prove it like 2 is equivalent to 2, which would be true. Or if you wanted to prove that 2 is not equal to 3, you would do it in a similar way to how we proved that 3 is not odd. You would say, okay, let's suppose I had a proof that 2 is equal to 3. How could, what constructor could it possibly be? And they would say, well, it sure can't be ruffle because 2 and 3 are not literally the same. And uh, so then it would just tell us, yeah, you don't have to do anything. I can just tell that there's no way that could possibly work. Um, I mean, here, let's do it. 2 is not, two is not equal to 3. Not 2. So if we pattern match, so we, we're, we're given a proof that 2 is equal to 3, and we have to produce bottom, right? So if we pattern match on the proof that 2 is equal to 3, it says, yeah, no, there's no way that you could actually have that. So just, there's nothing to do. Because it can look at them and say, well, look, they both start with successor, so let's compare, oh, they both have successor. Oh, what, look, this is 0 and this is successor, so those are not the same. So 